We're live. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Welcome, bienvenidos, wherever you are listening from today um, uh, in the world. I'm Sandy, you know, I'm your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm joining you today from Washington State, where, of course, here it is the afternoon of the 4th of July, typically called Independ Independence Day. Well, when looking at the focus or the theme for today's reading and thinking about it, um, I wanted to kind of take things away, uh, move away from the very traditional 4th of July kind of themes and broaden it to be inclusive of um, what historically, you know, independence has, has brought with it. And so this reading today is really flipping, you know, flipping, flipping the switch and bringing us the idea of interdependence. And what a better way to, ex what better way to explore that theme than through poetry, which by its very nature, even though we think about poets as uh, folks who, you know, the myth is that we all write alone and, but as we've really learned through particularly this, this past COVID pandemic year, we're very, very interdependent on one another. And I think that is one of the things that has um, propelled me through the pandemic is, is really being um, connected to all, all of the poets that'll be reading today and so many others that We've, that, 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 that we've all met during this time. So interdependence seemed the most perfect theme to amplify today. And today's reading is kind of back to the pure classic open mic format. Everyone here today, um, there's, we have no features today. It is uh, it is a fantastic display, uh, you know, a, a, a smorgasbord, a feast of poetry uh, from the folks who have gathered with us here in Zoom for your, for your and all of our uh, listening pleasure. I would be, I would be remnant, I would be, uh, I would be really off of my mark if I when I think of that word listening, I can't help but think of Michael Anthony Ingram's program, always quintessential listening. Uh, it's always about quintessential deep listening. And so I wanna just give a shout out. Michael has a program coming up this week, actually, uh, on Wednesday. If uh, right. Yeah, on Wednesday. So please put that in the chat. Everybody here in Zoom with us and on Facebook, um, uh, welcome. And I'm just going to get us, I'm not, I'm going to even let go of my usual stuff that I say about cultivating voices, live poetry, so that we can get right into the poems. So first up today, we have joining us from over in Ireland, the wonderful Matt Mooney. Thank you, Sandy. And um, I'll try to, to give you uh, some feeling of uh, how I feel uh, on uh, the great feast day, one might say, the great celebration that's taking place today in the free world, especially in the States on the 4th of July. So I, uh, I chose to read a poem by Robert Frost that he was to read at President John F. Kennedy's inauguration in 1961. But when he went to read it, it was in his own writing, uh, a poem called Dedication. It was in his own writing. And uh, like myself, 
I can't read my own writing either. But for, at times, but uh, the light, the light was uh, so strong, glinting off the snow that he that he couldn't just the made it worse, and he couldn't read his script. So he decided to read instead um, that a poem called "The Gift Outright" that he had in his head. So this was this is the undelivered poem um, at Kennedy's inauguration, a poem by Robert Frost. Summoning artists to participate in the august occasions of the state seems some, something artists ought to celebrate. Today is for my cause a day of days, and his be poetry's only fashioned praise. Who was the first to think of such a thing? This verse that in acknowledgement I bring goes back to the beginning of the end of what had been for centuries the trend, a turning point in modern history. Colonial had been the thing to be as long as the great issue was to see. What country be the one to dominate by character, by tongue, by native trait, the new world Christopher Columbus found? The French, the Spanish, and the Dutch were downed and counted out. Harry deeds were done. Elizabeth I and England won. Now came on a new order of the ages that in the Latin of our founding sages. Is it not written on the dollar bill we carry in our purse and pockets still? God nodded his approval of as good, so much those heroes knew and understood. I mean the great four, Washington, John Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. So much they knew as consecrated seers. They must have seen ahead what now appears. That they would bring empires down about our ears. And by the example of our declaration, make everybody want to be a nation. And this is no aristocratic joke at the expense of negligible folk. We see how seriously the races swarm in their attempts at sovereignty and form. They are our wards, we think, to some extent, but the time being and with their consent to teach him how democracy is meant. New order of the ages, did we say? If it looks none too orderly today, tis a confusion it was ours to start. So in it have to take courageous part. No one of honest feeling would approve a ruler who pretended not to love a turbulence he had the better of. Everyone knows the glory of the twain who gave America the aeroplane to ride the whirlwind and the hurricane. Some poor fool has been saying in his heart, glory is out of date in life and art. Our venture in revolution and outlawry has justified itself in freedom's story, right down to now in glory upon glory. Come fresh from an election like the last, the greatest vote a people ever cast. So close yet sure to be abided by, it is no miracle our mood is high. Courage is in the air, embracing whiffs, better than all the stalemate ends and ifs. There was the book of profile tales declaring for the emboldened, emboldened politicians daring to break with followers when in the wrong. A healthy independence of the throng, a democratic form of right divine to rule first answerable to high design. There is a call to life a little sterner and braver for the earner, learner, yearner, 
less criticism of the field and court, and more preoccupation with the sport. It makes the prophet in us all presage the glory of a next Augustan age, of a power leading from its strength and pride, of young ambition eager to be tried, firm in our free beliefs without dismay, in any game the nations want to play, a golden age of poetry and power, of which this noonday is the beginning hour. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt Mooney, for uh, bringing us right to the nation's capital uh, here on our interdependence reading. And we're gonna go right back to the nation's capital with our next reader, uh, Michael Anthony Ingram. Again, uh, wanna give a, give a shout out to Michael's, uh, Michael's reading series. Uh, on Blog Talk Radio, quintessential listening. Thank you so much for being with right. us today, Michael. Right, thank you, Sandy. I had planned to read something heavy, but it's such a beautiful day here in Washington, DC, that I wanna celebrate freedom, freedom to be. And uh, this is an important poem to me personally. I'm not sure whether it fits the theme, but I'd like to say it anyway. I'd like to say it anyway. It's entitled, Today I think I'll echo. Today I think I'll echo the beauty of the sun because like the sun I plan to rise up and greet the morn with a dazzling brilliance that cannot be denied. A majesty so great that the world cannot hide. So today I think I'll echo the beauty of the sun. And then I think I'll echo the song of the birds because like the birds I plan to sing a song so loud that the sound of my voice is carried across nations and the power of my words will lift like the thunder that began life's creation. So today I think I'll echo the beauty of the sun, the song of the birds, and then I think I'll echo the color of the grass because like the grass, my color too is rich. So rich the weeds cannot even touch me. Poisonous lies and incentrial indignations cannot destroy me because like the grass, you might step on me, cut me, cause me to fall. Just give me a minute and I'll turn and stand just as tall. So today I think I'll echo the beauty of the sun, the song of the birds, the color of the grass. And then I think I'll echo the coolness of the breeze because like the breeze, I too am cool like that. I'm all around like that. You might not see me, but my presence is still felt like that, still strong like that, still proud like that. So today I think I'll echo the beauty of the sun, the song of the birds, the color of the grass, the coolness of the breeze. And then when nightfall shrouds the earth in a peaceful darkness, I think I'll echo the glimmer of the moon. Because like the moon, it could be as dark as a starless night, but I know my luminous spirit will shine just as bright. So today I think I'll echo the beauty of the sun, the song of the birds, the color of the grass and the glimmer of the moon. And then I think I'll find something to eat because echoing the beauty of life always makes me hungry. Thank you. Oh, oh how fabulous. Thank you so much, Michael Anthony Ingram. Uh, again, I always, uh, say you truly know how to breathe life into poetry. Oh my gosh. Well, it, uh, it's about freedom. It's about freedom. It's about beauty. It's about oh. life. We, we take it for granted. And I think we should celebrate that too. Yes, thank you. Oh my gosh, perfect. Well, next we hop back over across the pond. Our, our dear friend, Ann McDonald, welcome. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Sandy. And um, that was fantastic, Michael. And Matt, as always, you blow it out of the water. So thanks so much. And um, I'm going to read a small poem, but one that I'm actually really proud of. And it's not often that I would say that about a poem. It's one I wrote last week. Um, but I was really kindly invited by Maura Barrett, who's a fellow CE member. I think, Dora, you know Maura. And um, to write a little piece for pride and community, because June being the pride one. And I was in the north of Ireland uh, two weeks ago for a couple of days. It's the most beautiful part of Ireland, but it was festooned every so often by flags. There's flags everywhere. And um, it got me thinking about the power of flags. I mean, it's just a piece of cotton or muslin, but oh my God, there's some emotion attached to it. 
So this is my homage, I suppose, to the collective hope that there will be a day when we will need no flag and every flag. And it's literally called the flag. I stitched the flag with all the colors of the rainbow. Then I added stars and hearts and an orange sash and a dash of green and a blob of red. And a stranger passing by said, what community is that flag for? I stitched the flag with threads of gold and told the stranger, that's the flag of hope. For when we need to have every flag and no flag, and everyone is free to nail their own colours to the map. For when our differences will no longer keep us parted, but will belong in a very distant past. The stranger said, I hope you know that flag looks ridiculous. And I said, don't you mean magnificent? Thank you. I long for that day. I do long for that day. I do long for that day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Anne. And we go next to Albuquerque. John Roche and of course, uh, John and Jules Nyquist are the hosts of the Cactus Reading Series. I know you're getting ready to go back in person, but you're going to keep a, keep a, a and keep a, a, you're going to keep doing a, an online reading once a month, maybe. So that, I think that's terrific. And welcome today. And so glad you could be with us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sandy. And we, we will have an online or Zoom one this, uh, this month with uh, Hilda Roz and Grace Bowers. So that should be good. I think it's the, it's the, the last Tuesday, whenever that is. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, from San Francisco poem City Lights. Uh, we just lost, you know, a great American poet um, last February. And this is not an overtly political or patriotic poem, but I think it fits in some ways called Challenges to Young Poets. Invent a new language anyone can understand. Climb the Statue of Liberty. Reach for the unattainable. Kiss the mirror and write what you see and hear. Dance with wolves and count the stars, including the unseen. Be naive, innocent, non-cynical, as if you had just landed on Earth, as indeed you have, as indeed we all have, astonished by what you have fallen upon. Write living newspapers. Be a reporter from outer space, filing dispatches to some supreme managing editor who believes in full disclosure and has a low tolerance level for hot air. Write an endless poem about your life on earth or elsewhere. Read between the lines of human discourse. Avoid the provincial, go for the universal. Think subjectively, write objectively. Think long thoughts in short sentences. Don't attend poetry workshops, but if you do, don't go to learn how to, but to learn what, what's important to write about. Don't bow down to critics who have not themselves written great masterpieces. Resist much, obey less. Secretly liberate any being you see in a cage. Write short poems in the voices of birds. Make your lyrics truly lyrical. Birdsong is not made by machines. Give your poem wings to fly to the treetops. The much quoted dictum from William Carlos Williams, no ideas but in things is okay for prose, but it lays a dead hand on lyricism since things are dead. Don't contemplate your navel in poetry and think the rest of the world is going to think it's important. Remember everything, forget nothing. Work on a frontier if you can find one. Go to sea or work near water and paddle your own boat. Associate with thinking poets, they're hard to find. Cultivate dissidents and critical thinking. First thought, best thought may not make for the greatest poetry. First thought may be worst thought. What's on your mind? What do you have in mind? Open your mouth and stop mumbling. Don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. 
question everything and everyone. Be subversive, constantly questioning reality and the status quo. Be a poet, not a huckster. Don't cater, don't pander, especially not to possible audiences, readers, editors, or publishers. Come out of your closet. It's dark in there. Raise the blinds. Throw open your shuttered windows. Raise the roof. Unscrew the locks from the doors, but don't throw away the screws. Be committed to something outside yourself. Be militant about it or ecstatic. To be a poet at 16 is to be 16. To be a poet at 40 is to be a poet. Be both. Wake up and pee. The world's on fire. Have a nice day. That's from uh, 2001. Thank you, John. Um, how I'm so glad to lift for Linguetti. I was just I was just reading poetry as an insurgent act uh like literally like this morning so to to have you bring for in and perfect yeah let's not be hucksters let's be poets and 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 that's where i think our true interdependence comes from is that that the sharing of the voices and uh so wonderful to have you bring uh all those reminders to us today well, thank you. And next we go to um, another of my really, I mean, everybody, my, I, one of my favorite people who's such a fantastic supporter of Cultivating Voices. And I've been so honored to get to also work with Risa Denenberg um, through the Headmistress Press Collectible Series as well. And um, uh, again, I, I'm so glad you're here today to share a poem. And I love also this mix of people's in own poetry and bringing in voices of other poets. It's really a beautiful combination today. So thank you, everybody. And welcome, Risa. Hi. Um, what a great intimate group of, of wonderful people here. Um, I, I tried to think if I had something appropriate and the um, to read today and the, the the theme of interdependence made me realize that even though this poem goes all over the place, it's really about intergenerational understanding and it's called Apocalypse Selfie. After decades of careening, we landed here, searching for a feather of hope, not a head in the oven, we spend most of our time trying to steer our solitary ships in the storm. I knew the day would come when we'd see each other as enemies. We love what we love and we hate what we don't love. Let's just say the world is too much with us or is it we are the world? When I was 17, so many wounded men told smile, my future vanished, as if a girl's smile could save anyone. In this town are old and sick 90-somethings waiting in their wheelchairs, baggy sweats worn over their depends, two world wars and a bowl of dust to eat when all the banks failed. No one tells their stories anymore. If I were prone to regrets, I'd admit that I have failed to fully love what I love. We have failed the future. Our breasts are the drooping ice shelves of Antarctica. Our gall is burning and brimmed with stones. Denial hung on our fragile limbs until they snapped. I hate to close the book with this sad refrain. I'd rather toast the future, say, Whew, we barely dodged that one. But all of Cascadia is burning. It's the miracle. You can stare right into the sun and not go blind. Thank you. So, so glad you brought that poem. I uh, wrote in the chat, I, I honestly, I, I can't hear that poem enough. And so I, for you to bring that today is really quite 
astounding. Thank you. Make sure that you put uh, Risa, of course, read, read that uh, recently as well uh, in New Book Showcase. Um, but to remind everybody about um, post-human and, and, and where they can get that astounding poem as well as the others, please put the information in the chat and thank you for, um, and thank you for joining us to share that amazing, incredible poem. <laughs> so glad you read it. Well, um, next is another poet who's been with us many, many times. I'm so glad to um, welcome back uh, and uh, greet just one of our perennial great friends and uh, translators and uh, head of uh, uh, Bright Hill Press, uh, the, the just really wonderful Bertha Rogers. Thank you. Also a salmon sister of mine. Yes, <laughs> salmon sister. Well, I know this was an inter, inter independence day, but I'm going to read a poem that's an interspecies poem. Um, and it's called To the Heart. I have taken up residence in the bear's black body. The bear's heart has devoured mine. I, all my thumping, am diminished, and the bear grows bigger. His seething face has, ab has absorbed all the day's light. His clawed paws are as turbulent as electricity at night. Heart, the sunflowers have been extinguished by hurled rays, and I am dead to the day. They told me I would discover morning, but here it is always night, though the walls be red and flowing, blood moves, genomes smart, but knowing not of itself, all its bodies sequenced and thwarted, though paginated, booked and shelved. The bear refuses to read the pages I was, spits me out. The blinded blinds move like flattened smiles in airs carried currents. Crows pick out, lay down airs, words between light's molten lines. Never forget you, never forget your thronged face, they cry. The bear is silent, his viral eyes red hot. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, you absolutely remind um, us, Bertha, that the beauty of the theme is how we all interpret it. And, and, and we go intergener from interdependence, we go to intergenerational, interspecies, and, 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 and all the spirals of what inter can mean and, and what interdependence, the necessity of that is. So I so appreciate that. Um, that the continued expansion of the theme. Let's let's not uh, let's not keep it narrow. Let's keep expanding it. So beautiful. Well, next I'm so, again. I'm just I'm just thrilled by um, everyone who is reading today, and uh, always very good. Just wonderful to any time of you have the opportunity to hear Rosaline Crowley. Welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'm here in Indiana, but I, as some of you might know, I'm from Ireland originally, uh, but I've lived here in Indiana for over 30 years. Um, the poem that I've chosen is an honor to, and celebrate a woman called uh, Maura Bradshaw. And Maura has uh, originally um, the Bradshaw Publishing in, in Cork, where I'm from. And the reason I want to celebrate her is because she gave me my first opportunity I went to her with a, a very put, shortly put together manuscript and she beautifully did this book for me called Point of Connection. And so at this point I'm on my third book and it was in this book that I actually wrote and published the poem in her honor and it's called She Gave Me Hope. So I hope it's in the, in the idea of, of being, uh, you know, inspired by women and others and just really uh, wanting to celebrate uh, the, how she influenced me and how, how she changed my life. She gave me hope. 
After a few minutes on the phone, she invited me to meet her the next day. I was comfortable from the first moment, her gray hair thrown back in a bun, wide open eyes greeted me sincerely. A kindred spirit, a pioneering attitude of openness, always searching for something else. A gatherer of people and words, a quiet spoken woman with dancing eyes. Now, forever in my heart, she lifted my spirit and gave me hope. She changed my life with her words. I see where you're going with this. My acknowledgement in my first book ends with ingratitude, as does my second and third. None of my poems hereafter, our first meeting, would have happened without Maura Bradshaw. Thank you. What a beautiful tribute. And again, uh, you know, a constant reminder that, you know, I, I, I think it's safe to say none of us here are here because we've been in a vacuum. Uh, you know, we have, we have done our work um, because of folks who have written before and supported us. Um, so strongly before we all have our mentors and and if that isn't uh, another sign of intergenerational interdependence uh you know how we move the voice from generation to generation i don't i you know again a great interpretation of today's theme thank you so much rosaline well uh next is carolyn wright and uh Red, I think in the second, uh, you were in the second reading that we had, um, or was it the first? Were you? Did you read in the very first Cultivated Voices? I should know my history. Um, I think I did. I think I, you did. I will have to check my archives, but I think I did. <laughs> has brought so has brought again so much to, um, uh, really you are the epitome of interdependence and in how you an editor translator curator of many many things including um an, a venture that that I, i'm happy to be a part of um the uh west east uh uh poets of the pandemic bicoastal poets of the pandemic reading series uh always so great to have you um mm -hmm read with us anytime we get to hear your fabulous voice and we'll be back with lily ledbetter on labor day as well um yes. from the anthology yes, absolutely that, that carolyn um edited uh so uh great to have you and thanks for the poem yeah and thanks so much for having me and and happy 4th of July, everybody. <clears throat> happy Independence and Interdependence Day. Um, I decided uh, one thing I haven't done all that much is, uh, uh, you know, kind of like talk about my Irish ancestry. Um, my father's parents came to this country in the early 1900s from Ireland, from basically, uh, Ballsbridge and uh, from, let's see, where else? Delgany in, uh, in County Wicklow. But this is a poem called Ancestress. Uh, it's from paternal grandmother, Lynn Ball. Uh, uh, and then she married uh, uh, let's see, Ernest Churchill Wright. That's my father. <laughs> that was my father's name. They were Anglo Irish, you know, Yeats's people. The poem is called Ancestra. She climbs the stairs slowly. A grand old lady stares out stained windows at the frozen garden, ties edged ribbons in the stray hairs of the day. Not much is left of the old ways. After the children moved out, the secret halls and corridors seemed to go on forever in all directions, a forgotten maze. 
the many generation family had learned perfectly the art of discreet evasion. Every time a butler passed, a door jam offered itself or a Persian drapery or a deep bay window. Hide here, they whispered. The others never look, never imagine anything different creeping in. It's always afternoon here, always prosperous and between wars, always dust free where the sun falls. Alone, her life runs down, clock left in a vent room. Her mind reshelving each thought, librarian at closing. Forgotten question Taylor calls as the afternoon sinks to its knees. Carolyn, we lost the feed on the, um, so you might want to go back just a little bit um, and maybe put your camera off. Yeah. I uh, went away for a second, I think. <laughs> anyway, I'm back. Andy, you're muted. Uh-oh. I was, I'm sorry. I was going to say, Carolyn, feel free to go back because we, you know, we lost the feed. So, uh, yeah, pick up in the poem, um, you know, about in the middle, I would oh. say. Oh, OK. I what? Uh, all right. I I thought maybe it was me. I thought it was, uh, you know, my my a Zoom malfunction or something. Uh, but I guess, uh, let's see, I need to find it again now. Um, <laughs> here it is. Okay. Um, I will, uh, I know that you got some of it. So I'll go here. Here we go. Every time a butler passed, a door jam offered itself, or a Persian drapery, or a deep bay window. Hide here, they whispered. The others never look. Never imagine anything different creeping in. It's always afternoon here, always prosperous and between wars, always dust free where the sun falls. Alone, her life runs down, clock left in a vacant room, her mind reshelving each thought, librarian at closing. Forgotten questions pay their calls as the afternoon sinks to its knees and light leans over the far edge of the fields like a child over a ledge. What does the blood say? Silence, please. The bird. Hmm. Bird's voice, the trees. Thank you. I hope you heard it. Yeah, we, Maybe. yes, we got it at the end. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And next we go to Phil Lynch. Great to have my salmon brother with us today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sandy. Hi, everybody. Um, and happy Independence Day. Um, I decided after your first introduction this evening to reach for this poem uh, on a whim, so I hope it goes okay. Um, it's, uh, but it's interdependent. Uh, it's because it emerged from a collaborative work that I was involved with a couple of years ago uh, with a multimedia artist, Hilary Williams, and a, a film maker and director, Bob Gallagher. And um, the theme of the collaboration was Hinterland, 
So we um, uh, interpreted liberally, um, both the physical and the mental and uh, all things between. And um, this is, uh, I contributed the words and this is a, a condensed version of that. And um, we took our starting point for those who know they're Dublin, where I am now in Ireland. Um, we took a starting point as a marsh in the area of Dunleary Rat Down, which uh, where I live. Uh, and that was the overarching theme of this whole Interland project, which resulted in an exhibition for about three, two weeks uh, of uh, about 25 such collaborative projects. So all that said, uh, here we go. It's called In Betweenness. Cold stones by the beach capture a glint of evening light, momentary blossoms on a monotone sandscape. After we ran aground, we found new headlands, dilapidated paths led us through a blur of briary firs to open marshes, fertile wetlands, refuge for wildlife. Tree trunks skulk by the marsh's edge, bare broken branches crane to watch us pass, protruding roots wrapped serpent-like around each other threaten our progress. A man at the edge relieves himself, adding to the detritus. Further in, the shapes of mountains stained by winter's harshest frost and sun-dried rains of summer slope down to meet the woods above the new roads, straddling the outer scatter. In between the hubbub of the hinterland, sinews stretched with every breath, remnants of salt marsh, sanctuary for species of wildlife to rest and refuel among flowers, shrubs, weathered plants. Circles of green and brackish water, graceful flight of the heron, its harsh call of arrival, a siren for the hard lives of those who come here to sleep and leave behind relics of their presence to taunt our consciences. Flutter of swift, swift wings before the splish as water is sliced with precision, Squawks and sweeter chirps from hedges and tangled growth over which hawks stalk their prey. Screech of wheels on steel of rail line dividing marsh from sea. Small boats bob, stiff breeze drives clouds to blow shimmering showers in over the brown shore. Across the space inside where news once went back and forth in written words images unseen, linking people and places. Flying ships now ply above this space that harbors history from before the city spread its cloak to wrap around a hinterland of plenty, rising to the hills, sheltered by the mountains, slanting to the sea, sinking in the swamp of progress, ever changing, evolving within its own skin, open to the world, orbiting on its axis while generations spin past, each believing they have seen the best of it. We, found, we find our own hinterland in the space between the image and the reality of place, our past and future bound by nature as the railway binds city to suburb and beyond. Like migrant species and sanctuary seekers, we too must move on. Thank you. What a, again, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a poem that really does capture that, that, that sense of interdependence on so many different levels. Thank you so much, Phil Lynch, for joining us today. And next we have another Wonderful friend to the program. Always enjoy when you join us. Max Vandersteen. Hello, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Sandy. And um, in honor of the theme today, interdependence, and in honor of our relationship between the US and Canada, I'd like to read a poem I wrote some time ago called Harmony. Um, I make this motion with my pen endeavoring to put an end to my silent charade, wanting to return not my friend to the emotional parade, but simply writing and strongly wishing 
only to recreate the wanting word that language has failed to communicate, the naturally implanted seed and man's elemental need for harmony. The quests and questions, acceptance or exceptions that comprise and compromise also contradict our inner nature. The seeming simplicity taken for granted is yet so elusive. If communication is the stimulus for the celebration between us, then let love convince the voice of the exclusive and be proof and poem of our harmony. If you could only reach me, if you could only teach me to hear you openly, to touch you honestly and humanly, to share your joys and pains, and to celebrate our lives and loves, then could we, my friend, revel in Earth's beauty and share its wealth in harmony. Thank you. Yes, sharing the wealth and harmony indeed is what it is all about. Thank you so much, Max, and uh, um, fabulous to have you joining us from uh, also your reading series um, that you host also uh, up in uh, the Alberta area. Please put information in the chat. I think the stroll, I think. Um, the Stroll of Poets is, might be on a little bit of a break. If I'm wrong about that, make sure you correct me. <laughs> oh, that well, is that, true. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was on a little bit of a break. But let folks know, they're such wonderful reading series um, that Max hosts and uh, looking forward to return in fall. Well, next we have Scott Norman Rosenthal. So glad you're joining us today as well. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Yeah, this is from back in the day. There was a vegetarian subculture around Stockton. Excuse my slur. I bit my tongue badly about a week or so ago. <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, so... Um, People would get together for vegetarian feasts and uh, there was dancing and folk music. And this was um, one of the people, um, there were two Alice's and it was absolutely no disrespect in our circles, we would refer to lesbian Alice and then there was blonde Alice. And blonde Alice was kind of slight and then lesbian Alice and we would joke her all the time, people joke because she had a leather, she and her business partner had a leather shop. <laughs> Are you into the leather? And you know, people, things were different. People did not, were not so, so fast to uh, decide that if something bothered them, they were hurt and burst into tears and talked about how evil was the person who hurt them. You know, people were, and we supported each other. Uh, the Mad Enchanter dances for Lesbian Alice, for Penelope Dugan, and for Eric Wallace. The past. Sister somewhere, land is burning. The people grow out of agony. Somewhere strange, wondrous, other voices, sunlit cadence, folk rejoice. The hope, corn of the soil, doorways of childhood, youth, what place we might envision. The dancing, there are fires, there be autumn and the land has spun about, about again. We might walk, shift our way around fires through the land again, again. Sister, we may leap, transcend the fires, walk about through the land again, again. Um, that was spring 87, which was kind of a retro because everything was already kind of, you know, fading by then. Wow, again, again. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us today. 
yeah, the, that 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 power of living in community um, uh, makes me think of you know different ways that people have organized themselves to um, work cooperatively. Well, next we go to the Bronx to Patricia Kerrigan who read just a couple weeks ago with us from Angel Fire. So great to <gasps> Brooklyn. Brooklyn, what please. The hell? I can't believe it. Why did I say Bronx? I don't know. Brooklyn, all the way. Brooklyn, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I got it. I got it. I corrected myself. I corrected <laughs> myself. <laughs> anyway, great to have you here with us today. It's Brown. It's the the series is Brownstone Poets. Um, you've seen it all throughout the pandemic. Uh, again, I'm, I'm mentioning all these reading series with uh, hopes that I'm not forgetting anybody today, because certainly um, our ability to uh, be connected has has been through all of these, um, the labor of all of the work that folks um, have done to host uh, reading series. So thank you, Patricia, okay. for being thank one you. of those beacons. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, this is like interdependence. It's a uh, jazz inspired poem. It's called Ruby, My Dear. Ruby believed that the past lived in air particles, that walls were witnesses, a black and white movie invisible to all except her. Ghosts of former residents, daily battles in loveless marriages and family disputes. Fruitless dreams of the Irish sweepstakes, breadwinners' salaries to pay bookies and barkeepers' rents. From the collapsed kitchen ceiling, a leak's a cappella rhythm bangs inside a plastic pail. The voice of angry water sang about accumulated neglect. Ruby's mama clenched her tears, a victim of systemic neglect. No family to fall back on and her foster parents never cared. Her husband disappeared, left her to deal with life on her own. She had to be strong, had a daughter to raise, worked two jobs, long hours, menial pay, sacrificed her daughter's needs, not enough to feed her landlord's greed. Government assistance had holes in its pockets and she considered herself lucky to still be eligible. She immersed herself in jazz CDs instead of crack. Monk would take the coal train. Grice would ride his sax and more. Jazz from an earlier time named her daughter Ruby to honor Monk. Ruby studied her mama's expression, found strength in her eyes. She immersed herself into air particles, listened to the leak become jazz. Let crayons recite her stories inside a thick spiral notebook. Thank you. Oh, that image of the thick spiral notebook. That 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 spiral makes me also think of the idea of interdependence, the image of that. Thank you so much, Patricia. So great to have you with us today. Well. Our next reader, again, a dear friend to our program and um, uh, has, has been uh, just, has added so much to the reading series over these months. I can't really say enough about um, Amit Dahiyabadsha. Thank you so much for being here today with us. And um, I, I can't wait to hear your poem. Sandy, can you hear me? You got it. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for for being there for poets who are hanging on in the twilight zone. Uh, COVID has taught me the importance of the moment. You know, not the lifetime just the moment, how important and precious the moment is. So 
Can you hear me? So my poem is called Here and Now. It's from an anthology of about uh, two volumes and almost 950 pages of poetry. Uh, let me see if I can show you the cover. Can you see it? No, or you can't. No, see it's not anything. showing up. It's in that. I'll just read you the poem. Here and now. Break the hourglass, scatter sand. Time spends itself upon the open, empty waiting hand. Break the hourglass, scatter sand. Time spends itself upon the open, empty waiting hand. In the vacant darkness, fate looms. Weaving endless dreams of broken past and unbuilt future. Between the frozen ether, the unbroken dawn, your wings are bound in sleeping shroud, the sun, an instrument of your vision, to lightly brush and gild the dawn. It shimmers sweet and waits upon the opening of your eyes. It's true that time has flown. And still swift it flies, but look how vast the new horizon lies. Wake now, the future needs a footprint across the slow quicksand of too much stillness. Before the turning of time's fickle tide, take up the cadence of the heart, a new footprint, a brave new stride. Take up the anthem waiting to be sung in five senses, not only one. Amid the whispers and new battle cries, beneath the fireworks of your burning fears, the drumming of your heart inside, your time has come. Now find the strength to wake somehow, do something, anything, do it here and now. Thank you. If that is not a poem of an interdependence and a reminder that the here and now are symbiotic of each other, I don't know what is. Thank you always for being you, with sir. us and for all the and for all the ways that you contribute. And Thank you. again, send you continued healing energy. Um, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, I'm in bad voice these days, but I promise to get better soon. Your voice is perfect, however you are in the here and now, always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, next, so, I, next I see that Kim Ports Parsons, you told me you weren't gonna share a poem, but you're gonna grace us with a poem today. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad to. I'm so inspired by everyone. And it's so amazing, the organic quality of this group, because my poem is like almost a continuation of the theme that Amit's poem started, which is everything we do is creation. Everything we do is creation. It's so easy to forget that, you know. So it's really kind of a big responsibility. I wrote years ago a series of poems called Creation Poems, and I'm going to read one segment from this. Uh, this section begins with the phrase, I know a woman who makes gardens of light. So here we go. I know a woman who makes gardens of light. She is a teacher. She makes a garden of light in a room of blank faces, a circle of muteness. She grows gardens of words, tosses them out to her listeners, and they sparkle, chips of ruby, flakes of emerald. She plants thoughts, dreams, and questions. She grows light on her tongue. It sprouts in her hair shoots from her fingers, glows in her eyes. She disappears when the faces begin to take shape as the souls inside come out to be heard. She goes on to a new garden, wearing beads of purple, 
green and silver beads of words, beads dripping around her shoulders, beads of words that glisten. She tosses them like seeds and language rises, rises from the soil of her thoughts. The words go flying with the birds. I know a woman who spreads light around her. She rides her words like the wind. She is a teacher. And uh, could be about Sandy, could be about any of you amazing women poets out there who read today. Happy interdependence, interconnection, interrelationship, harmonious, freedom, loving, peace, poetry, people. Good to be with you today. Beautiful contribution. And uh, when I read, my poem's going to connect right back to your poem. <laughs> that makes me inordinately so happy. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, thank you for all that you do to support the series. Um, again, this collaborative effort. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. Uh, and I'll say it again and again and again. Well, next, an another poet who is with us week after week after week. And uh, it is. Uh, you know, the, when, I, when I think about kind of the epitome of the spiral and, 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 and who is kind of the glue that, that holds things together, I think of Kate Wegrison joining us today from Colorado. Thank you for being here. Hello, and thank you so much. Um, I love being compared to being a spiral and happy interdependence day. I'm a little analytical, so I counted the E's, the most common letter, and there were five E's. And I heard Amit talk about our five senses. And then when I hear E's, I can't help but thinking about when the whiz came out. And I had just opened my store back in the 70s, and I would advertise don't you carry nothing that might be a load. You just ease on down, ease on down, ease on down that road. Yeah, so that was my lead to the fact that a year ago, I was inspired by not only um, Sandy Yunon's Cultivating Voices, but by a change, and I decided that this was my prayer. May I study the magnificence of living on this planet as poet. I am inspired by each person spiraling through all they have learned, carrying the passion for peace. Today, I bring you this poem that I did read over a year ago and it is inspired in epigraph by Brazilian photographer, now New Yorker, Angelica Das. She traveled the world over. I have traveled through reading National Geographics and that's where I read about her. And she traveled the world and she amassed 4,000 portraits and compared the pixels of our nose letting us realize there is no exact color. Here is my poem. Everywhere we rise. We lift the veil century by century, no longer blind to bias, the root of suppression. We rise to reject the cruelty of people for property indentured to poverty. We are done with the reign of tyrants raging in armies or in communities with vulgarity. We now, as seekers for humanity, outpace the tormentors of caustic infliction. We support the sovereignty of matriarchal equality where power mongrels separate and divide with lies. We march for justice and freedom for all. 
We are not shells to be tossed to the sea. Our worthiness reacquaints our likeness. We turn the tide. We are the art of skin color. 2000 in the Pantone Library of Artists. We now are indebted to acknowledge 4000 by founder of Humane researcher Angelica, Angelica Dias, excuse me, Angelica Das. We no longer pen in pseudonym. We thrive with education, giving us voice without retribution. We broadcast through ley lines worldwide. We build bridges, continent to continent for all people. I love you all. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You always bring the heart and soul, Kate. You always bring the heart and soul. Thank you. And thank you for reprising that poem that was, you know, that also moved us. The first time I was privileged to hear it. Thank you. I we're down to our final few readers and our next reader. So excited, so glad to have Doll Mathis with us. Thank you, Doll. Thank you so much. Um, I just wrote this today, so it's just a draft. And um, I did not, I'm sorry to say no about the theme. So this really is not related to your chosen theme. And again, it's just a draft. Um, it's after John Berryman, whom I've been reading lately um, to try to decide whether to teach him for the first time in my life. Um, he's problematic for reasons that many of you will probably be familiar with, but he's also so freaking exciting and still so, uh, he's still unique. Um, specifically, uh, this, this thing is, um, is composed of three um, sestets and um, uh, has a rhyme scheme of ABC, ABC. And then if you start over with the second stanza, it's ABC, CBA, and then um, ABC, ABC. And specifically, it's um, sort of after um, Dream Song 312, which is about uh, uh, William B. Uh, Yates. It's simply called This Fourth. And again, I just wrote it today after John Berryman. <clears throat> Let me see if I can see Risa. There she is. I'm going to have her in my, make sure she's there. I'm, uh, she's the one who invited me to this, and I've been attending it for quite a while. So I certainly wouldn't be doing this if not for Risa. And I thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, this fourth. Discovery 2016, I don't know you. Born here, raised, thought I knew you well, so many years ago. After four years, <clears throat> years, surely I see through your illusory heavens, see your real hell. Many ask, what have we turned into? Summer 2021. Our jab rates are low. Will this open forth be a curse for stubborn patriots, afraid of the vax, afraid of the facts? When ill, regret, remorse, but shift, I too have brought a book or two. What of now, my friends, will last? Behind today, Hughes's bitter river of death. Our high figures don't float, will become just dust in the past. But those who can, take an easy breath. Beside our ideal, I breathe a moat. Thank you. Well, thank you for bringing that poem. Actually, I think it fits in perfectly with the theme of interdependence because um, really our survival depends collectively uh, on us paying attention to those facts, getting vac vaccinated and um, 
you know, that, that my wellness is my brother and my sister's wellness. It's not just mine. So thank you um, really for that, 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 that message of, of moving us forward, uh, really so, so vital. Thank you so much. I'm gonna ask Marsha Karp to read next, uh, if you would. Um, and uh, great to have you with us today. Thank you, I'm sorry to sneak in late. I didn't understand how this worked. No worries. Um, Welcome. What is left? We think it is new. We are so, so afraid. We think there has never been, ever been a thing like our thing. So we are so afraid. Just think a village rapes a girl, a village burns a man. Here is the maelstrom. Here is the horror. People we like are like people we don't. It is our turn to live it and not know what hit us. It is our turn for mayhem that droppeth as rain. It is our turn to cry we are virtue's last bastion while mayhem and help us turn us into them. She is 12 and they rape that girl over and over. That collar of tire which then becomes fire, is fitted by many hands to one neck. Nobody taught us, we know how to do it. We shout and we leap for our lives to some standing. It is you, no, not I, yes, and no, 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 help us. We say that that thing is loosed from another town over. Oh, tut, tut. Just think, it is ours and is us. What is left for our thing when havocs and swing, all against all, first among none? There is the shadow side to interdependence and um, Again, what a powerful poem to illustrate that. Marsha is gonna be reading with us later in New Book Showcase later this year. And very excited to have you um, with us today. Thank you very much for um, hopping in on the open mic. <laughs> Again, a, a, a vital critical piece. Well, um, it's, it's just Don and myself now. And uh, I've, been, I've been waiting um, all week, really all month, ever since we did the theme of interdependence. I actually really thought a, a lot about Don's poetry in um, kind of manifesting this theme. So I'm very grateful to have you read a poem today, Don. Thanks, Sandy, and, and thanks everyone. It's a, a lot of good poems here today. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take us back to that first poem that we heard by Robert Frost. Um, the poem I'm gonna read to you is from a, a group. That's a, it's one poem, but it's essentially a folio titled "Gaslight Generations." which I've, I've retitled it, The Big Lie. And um, I found a new epigraph for, the, for the, whole, the big poem, listening to that Robert Frost poem. So let me read it to you. And remember that that poem was, was to be read at, at John Kennedy's inauguration, right? 1961, so 190 years after the Declaration of Independence or thereabouts, maybe 185. So much those heroes knew and understood. I mean the great four, Washington, John Adams, Jefferson and Madison. So much they knew as consecrated seers. They must have seen ahead what now appears. 
that would bring empires down about our ears and by the example of our declaration. It's the extraordinary irony of that. Three slaveholders and a fourth wealthy white man, all of whom had the power to end slavery 80 years before it ended, had the power to give women the vote 150 years before it happened, and we all believe it. That's the power of propaganda and the power of indoctrination that's built into us. Nobody even thinks twice about that stuff unless you push back against it and then you get pilloried. In the beginning, there are no slaves. Anyone that sets foot here becomes free. Men and women are equal before the law. Article 19, Pinochet's constitution. Our fathers conceived America in war and a sweet promise, all men are equal. 13 years later at full term with a crow quill dipped in iron gall ink, they aborted their oath to the enslaved indigenous and the unmale. Even Chile's tyrant did better. As always, as always. Um, you know, the consciousness that you bring to your work and to remind us of our shared humanities, right? I go back to your poem, Our Shared Humanities. Thank you so much, Don. Well, I'm going to end today's reading um, with a poem by Joy Harjo. <laughs> And um, I really think that this poem, I felt it was important for me to acknowledge the folks that, you know, lived here in the, on this continent before, before colonization. And so I wanted to um, bring our U.S. Poet Laureate's voice to you all today. Um, this is a poem. Also, I'm just going to also plug a, an anthology that Joy Harjo edited um, also with Leanne Howe and Jennifer Elise um, Forster called When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. Um, a, an anthology of Native Nations poetry. This poem doesn't come from um, that. This is one of Joy's poems. It's called, Perhaps the World Ends Here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what we must eat to live, the gifts of the earth are brought and prepared set on the table. So it has been since creation and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table, we gossip recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves. And as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house 
in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth at this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. Well, everybody, thank you today for all of your sweet interconnected bites. Uh, our our bite-size open mics, our open mic reading one poem a piece, or actually complete buffets at a kitchen table, each of your voices, um, each of the prismatic themes that you brought to our theme of interdependence today. Uh, I want to encourage uh, all of you listening to keep out, keep seeking out those poems that seek to connect us to one another in the myriad of ways that we need to continue to be connected. Well, that has been today's special edition, our, our 4th of July Interdependence Day edition of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. And again, thank you to all of our, our readers, uh, Matt Mooney, Michael Anthony Ingram, Ann McDonald, John Roche, Bertha Rogers, Max Vandersteen, Rosaline Crowley, Kate Wegrizen, Scott Norman Rosenthal, Risa Denenberg, Patricia Kerrigan, Phil Lynch, Dal Mathis, Amit Dahiyabacha, Carolyn Wright, Marcia Karp, Don Krieger, Kim Ports Parsons. Thank you all. I hope I did not forget anyone. I was reading right off the names here on my screen. Um, what a what a what a what a fireworks display as we had in our in our uh, on our poster for today. So glad you you all chose to join us to share your words of wisdom and um, and and chants and calls for peace and unity and love and togetherness and remembrance remembrance of 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 where of where of where we have faltered and where we still need to do our deep deep work it begins with listening and poetry is one of the best ways that we can listen to each other i appreciate you all coming out this sunday and any sundays that you're joining us I'm Sandy, you know, and your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. A reminder, we will be back next week for our new books showcase. And we uh, uh, don't miss it. And on July 18th, we will be back with our next poet's focus on the theme of translation. So please bring your, if you're a translator, please bring poems you've translated and, or if someone's translated your poems, we welcome poems from people's home languages as well as in English. We would love to hear, um, uh, to hear the home languages as well. Well, I, I, I wish you a very, very good week. Uh, enjoy your, celebrations this evening, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are. A most uh, glorious day to you and thank you for spending part of it with me. Until next time.
My friends, stay very safe, take good care of each other. And of course, keep writing your miraculous poems.